4, and look at verse 13. Here we're given a very important passage of Scripture, and I think this is very important for all of us tonight. And uh, I say this, that I want to end on time because I realize the value of time, and you'll see that in our text here tonight. Look at verse 13. I'll read the text aloud. You follow along. James chapter 4 and verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, look at these first three words in verse 13. Have you used these words in your casual conversation? Do you know what those three words mean all together? I, I had to think about it. I know what each word individually meant, but I didn't know what that expression meant. Go to now. If I were to tell you, go to now, what would you do? What action would you take? Now, I understand the immediacy of that command, but what does it mean? Well, it's not a modern English phrase. It's not an old English phrase. It's a phrase used by Jewish mothers. And here's the idea. Uh, James is using it, and he uses it actually twice. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men. So watch this. See if you can pick up the understanding of these three words. Ready? Go to now. Go to now. Hey, go to now. So James is employing something used by Jewish mothers to say this. Pay attention. Hey, listen up. Look right up here. Give me your full attention for what I'm about to say is of utmost importance. And he's really coming to the conclusion of what he said now for the greater por portion of four chapters. And he's about to wrap up his thought. And here he says, go to now. Pay attention. And so I would encourage us. Pay attention. Look right this way. What you're about to hear from this particular New Testament prophet in an Old Testament fashion, pay attention, because what you're about to hear is important. It's a phrase used by Jewish mothers. Who was James' mother? Uh, James was the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, his mother was Mary. Mary had to use this phrase on James and didn't have to use this phrase on Jesus. Um, as we near the end of a school year, uh, we homeschool over our kids, and we were doing it before it was cool, before everybody else was doing it. And uh, sometimes we place an incentive for finishing well at the end of a school year, uh, usually something with ice cream or candy or pizza. Yes, we incentivize food. Yes, yes, yes. But then the first one crossed the line, uh, gets that prize, and then I have to employ this phrase with the rest of my children. Okay, let's go. Pay attention. we got to finish the school year and finish it strong. Do well. I'm reminded of that particularly viral video of young Mateo saying to his mother rather disrespectfully, Linda, Linda, listen, listen. Linda, Linda, listen, listen. Pay attention right here. Listen up. Let me have your full attention. If you're caught in the riptide of American culture, the one that, that's pulling believers out to sea, I saw it in our single young adult ministry, the, the philosophies and the temptations of the world were constantly tugging at individuals. It's leading marriages into destruction. It's confusing people as far as identity and sexuality. It's pulling more and more believers out to sea. What do you do, church? Are we winning the culture war? Have we lost already? This is the message that we need to hear. So look up, open your ears, pay attention to these words. 
These New Testament believers, due to opposition and persecution, were scattered abroad across the Roman Empire. They were caught in the undertow of Roman hedonism, and they were destroying their testimony. And the foundation of the testimony of Christ was at stake. They were taking each other to court publicly. They were consumed by money and things. They were unbridled in their tongue. They were gossips. There was infighting, class envy, and pride. They were unimpressive as an example of God's children. And so in chapter 1, James lays out the rebuke. He says, don't be hearers of the word and not doers. You've heard it, but God doesn't judge you about what you know. Satan, the demons... Angels believe and tremble. It's not about what you know. It's about what you do with what you know. So don't just be a hearer of the word without being a doer of the word. Second rebuke in chapter 2. Don't have faith with respect of persons over money or clothes or status or ethnicity. Racism has always been an enemy of the gospel. It's the opposite of what it is. Our gospel goes to Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, hold on. Judea and Samaria, they're back to back. They're next door neighbors. Why did Jesus mention Samaria? Because the Jews didn't want to go there because of racism. Our gospel goes where it's culturally uncomfortable because the gospel transcends culture. Christ transcends culture, family. Chapter three, he says, watch your mouth. The tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. What you say has value to it. And it's a little thing. It's a rudder that steers an entire ship. So here he's getting to chapter 4. He's about to come to the conclusion. Look at verse 8 of chapter 4. He says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. He's coming to the solution. If you'll draw nigh to God, he's right there with the answer that you're seeking. You won't find any satisfaction As the great hymn writer Mick Jagger wrote, I can't get no satisfaction. It's because every attempt to look like, act like, be like the world leads to unsatisfaction. The only thing that will lead to satisfaction is the truth found in God's word. The gospel itself, faith is the victory. So he gets to verse 10 of chapter 4. He says, what's the solution? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up. How did you come to Christ in the first place? You humbled yourself. You came to the end of your philosophy. You came to the end of your beliefs. You came to the end of yourself. And you repented. You changed your mind about what you believed. And you you hung your entire weight of belief on Jesus Christ by faith. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And now we get to this particular section of Scripture. He says, go to now, listen up, pay attention, because what I'm about to say is about to give everything its proper value. Now, in Texas, if you were to come visit me in my home in Fort Worth, I'd probably take you out to eat, and I'd probably take you to get some barbecue. Now, I know they have barbecue up here, but it ain't like home. I take you out to a barbecue restaurant. Um, Maybe Spring Creek Barbecue. I'd let you go ahead of me in line and get your tray. You know what that means. I'm taking care of the bill. So I let you get anything you want. You're not that hungry, so you get an entire rack of ribs. And then, then you get your order, and you're about to walk to the table. I tap you on the shoulder and say, don't eat those ribs. In Texas, those are fighting words. Don't mess with another man's barbecue. I don't know if that's a phrase. It is now. So what if I saw something that you didn't see? You're about to eat those ribs, and I saw something that was devastating. I saw them take your ribs from the smoker, and they dropped it. They dropped the pass, and it went directly on the floor. And they picked it up with ungloved hands, put it back on the plate. It's filled with whatever's on the floor. It's probably covered with COVID, and then they... they <laughs> Serve it to you. And you're about to take that. You're about to eat it. And I saw the whole thing. You didn't. Uh, What would you think of me if I just told you to don't eat those ribs? Uh, You'd you'd probably want to fight me. You'd say, Brother Johnson, do you know how to to box? No. How grateful would you be if you knew the import 
of what I told you. Don't eat those ribs. I'm helping you avoid the path that you're going down. That's the idea here. James sees something in the scattered believers. He's seeing something day after day. He's seeing a pattern here, and he brings this rebuke. Number one, we learn a truth about the future. Look at verse 13. Go to now. Are you the type of person that says this, ye that say, today or tomorrow? We will go into such a city. Okay, we're going to go to a certain place, and it's going to be at this certain time. We're going to do it. If it's going to happen, I'm going to make it happen. It doesn't stop there. He said, we will go into such a city and continue there a year. Here's the space of time that we're going to be there. Here's a starting time and an ending time. And then we're going to pull out. Then, not only that, we're going to go into business. We're going to buy and sell. But not only that, he says, we're going to get gain. He says, we're going to turn a profit. He's predicting all of this. That's like... uh, Saying, I'm going to go to Chicago and make it big. I'm going to go to Hollywood to get discovered. I'm going to go to Washington and make a difference. I'm going to go to college and study this particular field. I'm going to make it happen. He says, all of these plans, I'm going to make happen. This is the same thing that you might hear at a motivational speaker conference. It revs up the crowd. If you're going to make a success out of your life, you're going to be the captain of that success. But the entire plan is negated in three words in the next verse. Look at verse 14. Whereas, what are those next three words? Ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Here's the truth about the future. You don't know the future. Maybe you read the weather report today and and saw that it was all the prognostication and all the predictions. You found that that was inaccurate. You don't know the future. And nobody does. All this planning, all this preparation, all this, and what what the rebuke is, it's not a a rebuke against wise planning. You see the book of Proverbs. This is a rebuke against presumption, presuming upon the plan of God. They were making presumptions. Instead of the wise planning, look to the ant, thou sluggard, consider thou her ways and be wise. They were saying, if it's going to happen, I'm going to do it. And that's a big difference. Making plans without consulting and yielding to God. Realizing that God may stop it if he chooses. As a matter of fact, God may have different plans altogether. These people haven't considered that God didn't want them to go to that city at such a time, or to even make a profit. How many of you have worked in a business that didn't make a profit? God has different plans. So this is how we should go about our planning. Make your plans, but don't make them in permanent ink. I think nearly 13 years ago, I was on staff as the music minister of Worth Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. And we came to Fort Worth with just one half-sized truckload of our belongings. Not the big one, not the 26-foot one, but the little U-Haul as we moved back into Fort Worth. And we thought we were going to be there forever. Every one of the former staff members is already there for a long, long time, for a long, long time, for decades and decades. We thought we were going to dig our roots in deep. God had different plans. He said, I want you to, see, to use the tools that you've been given there, not just at one place, but at lots of places. I want you to proclaim the word of God, not just at one place, but strengthen many, many churches. Think of how much this church has changed in just a short amount of time. Five years? What was it then? What is it now? In just a short amount of time. Not knowing the future is perfectly normal. Being surprised is part and parcel of the Christian life. I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. I'm thankful for with where he's leading, but he could change where I'm going at a, moment's, at a moment's notice. Who knew of the job changes, the sicknesses, the sheltering in place that we go in in just a year? Who knew the future? It reminds me of the farmer who had the bumper crop in Luke chapter 12. He said, I've got too much to fill in one barn. I'm going to tear it down. I'm going to build more barns. And Jesus, this is Jesus' words. He says, thou fool, this night will your soul be required of you. You don't know the future. 
James is speaking to these men and women who are making plans for an entire year, and you can't even be sure of tomorrow. You know not. So here's the second truth. There's a truth about the fleeting. We see a truth about the future. Let's look at the fleeting. Look at verse 14 again. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. Life is fleeting. And some of you in this room know how fast life goes. In fact, you could probably tell me that life is moving faster than we could possibly imagine. Grandfathers, grandmothers have, that have seen more life than I have can attest to it. The Greek word for vapor is the word atmos, which is where we get the word atmosphere. Picture those lenticular clouds that form around the top of a mountain. They're beautiful to watch. They're swirling around. That, that You want to take a picture of them, but they appear for a little time and then vanish away. So the one thing we can be absolutely sure about is that our life is short and we don't know the future. I just turned 38, but there was a, an artist who died at age 37. Uh, the Renaissance painter Raphael died at 37 years old. I'm talking about the Renaissance painter, not the Ninja Turtle here. <laughs> Raphael died at age 37, and at his funeral, he was laid in state at the Sistine Chapel, and then they brought in his largest, last masterwork. It was called the Transfiguration. And the most amazing thing about the Transfiguration, and here's the picture right here, the most in, it, important thing about this particular masterwork was he died before he finished it. The drafts of this particular piece featured many more characters that he hoped to include in the final copy. And it just reminds me that you're going to die one day and leave some things undone. So don't just do good things. Don't even settle for great things or even the best things. It reminds me that we ought to do God's things with the time that we have. We'll almost never finish all the things that we want to do. The person who realizes how short their time is won't complain about lumpy mashed potatoes. Well, the pastor didn't even talk to me today. That deacon didn't even shake my hand. The choir didn't sing my favorite song. You won't complain if you realize how short your time is. Did you know that Satan realizes how short his time is? Read Revelation. He knows how short his time is, and that's why he's so active in this world. And it's the Christians who don't realize how short their time is. So pay attention. Your time is short. It's not what we hear or what we know. Yeah, I know. I don't have a lot of time. What are you doing about it? I'm reminded of the children's rhyme. Doctor, doctor, will I die? Yes, you will, and so will I. We spend thousands upon our, uh, upon our health, and we, and we try to elongate our life, but there will be a time when we die, and even medical professionals will pass away. The great philosopher Winnie the Pooh said this. In just two days, tomorrow will be yesterday. Oh, bother. Realize how fast time goes. There will be a time when you stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and you will wish that you'd given him more with the time that you've been given. He gives to you according to your several ability, as we're reminded in Scripture. He knows who you are and what you can take. He gives to you according to your several ability, and then you'll stand account for what he's given you with the time that he's given you. So what are you doing with it? I would encourage you with the next point. There's a truth about the future, a truth about the fleeting. Number three, there's a truth about the Father. Look at verse 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now, I'm from the South, and it's easy to tack this as a colloquialism. You say it. Hold on. Colloquialism. Okay, there we go. We can tack it on the ends of sentences like this. Ready? Lord willing. Well, I'll go fishing with you, Lord willing. I'll be at that prayer breakfast, Lord willing. I'll meet you down there at the store, Lord willing. And we could just say it because the Bible tells us to, but we have failed to consider 
the Lord's will. We make our plans, but we bow before His will. It's a very important truth, and it's not cliche to the Apostle James. The word Lord, there are nine words translated Lord in our scripture. The word Lord that's mentioned here is the word kurios. It's where we get the word master or ruler or what we call boss or employer. Now here's one thing I know about a boss or an employer. They hire you and you perform that specific task at that specific time. For that amount of time, you show up when you're supposed to, you leave when you're supposed to, and they can even tell you when the end of the job is. Amen. He's our boss. He's in charge. And we say, Lord willing, because he's the master of all of our plans. Consider the one who's in charge. Life is short. Our future is uncertain. My life is in the Lord's hands. He's in control. So pay attention tonight. You that say you're going to go and do this and that, but you haven't considered the will of God. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know that your life is a vapor. Get the Lord back in the picture and get your thoughts and ideas and plans founded in him. For about 100 years, businessmen from a certain culture ended their correspondence by writing these two letters at the end, D.V. I'm going to send this shipment, D.V., We'll have this business meeting, DV, and it stood for the Latin, Deo Valente. And it simply meant, Lord willing, it would be nice if everyone in Washington understood the concept of Lord willing before they promised and pontificated about what the future might hold. I remember, I remember going through the Loray Caverns of the Shenandoah Valley, beautiful green hills. How many of you have ever been to that area of Virginia? The Shenandoah Valley is beautiful. In the Luray Caverns, it's a great tour, and uh, they guide you all around the caverns there. It has a very unique feature. They feature the slag pipe organ. The slag pipe organ is an 88 key electronically driven uh, keyboard hooked to the slag tights and the slag mites all over the cave. And so as you play on the keyboard, it taps on those stalactites and forms a musical tone. And the tune that I heard that day when I was on my honeymoon and, and toured that, cav that cavern, the tune that I heard was, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was celestial. It was amazing. All throughout the cave. And one of the things I observed from our tour guide as she uh, marched us through the cave was she kept repeating a five-word sermon. Here's what she said. Stay close to your guide. Stay close to your guide. Hey, stay close to your guide. They wanted us to look up and find our guide and stay close. Amen. There was a part of the tour where they turn off all the lights and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was disorienting how uh, dark this blackness was. And I'm glad I stayed close to my guide because my guide knew where the light switch was and she knew where the path was. So. In times of darkness, when you don't know what to do tomorrow, there's a question mark on the future. Lord, what do we do? What do we do as a church? Stay close to your God. In the dark, don't doubt what God has already shown you in the light. Keep on moving. Talk to people that make their plans like this. Talk to church staffs at staff retreats. What should we do next year? Well, what did we do last year? Hold on. Stay close to your God. The Lord is leading. He is building. What should the Lord's will be for our church? And then we get finally, we get a truth about the future, a truth about the fleeting, a truth about the Father. We should submit our plans before the will of God. And then we get to the therefore in verse 17. Whenever you see the word therefore, you ought to ask, what's the therefore? Therefore. He's making his summation. He's coming to the end of his thoughts. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So listen up, pay attention, here's the whole point. He that knoweth to do good, it's right in front of you, it's here, it's now. There's an immediacy in the nature of the gospel. Today is the day of salvation, now is the accepted time. There's a will of God and it must be done at the speed of the impulse of the Holy Spirit. There's an immediacy. There's divine appointments everywhere that we must respond to immediately. If we were to take this verse outside of its context, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him and his sin, I can hear my mother saying that to me as a child. 
Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's the same morality that you might approach Santa Claus with. Be good, for goodness sake. But when we understand that our life is short, there isn't an infinite amount of time to do not just good things, but God's things. If you don't do it, there are lost people that may not get a chance to hear about the gospel if you don't respond at the impulse of the Holy Spirit of God. God's things might not be done and they'll be left undone for all of eternity. Now, the Lord will do His will, but He wants to use you. Now, I have things that I'm given to be done by my wife and the honeydew list. Uh, you know, I'll get to it one of these days. Have you ever used that phrase? Uh, one of these days, I'll do it. Maybe there's an a ever-growing list of one of these days you'll get to it. But God's will says do it now because you may not have an opportunity to do it in the future. He that knoweth to do good, it's right in front of you. Do it now. If there's something right and good and godly and helpful and Christ-honoring and you're putting it off, it's sin. Here's some things that can help us today by way of application. Look here, if you're not saved, who knows what could happen tomorrow? Get saved today. Don't just walk to Christ, run to Him. He's waiting there for you. He wants you to put your faith in Him. Don't delay any longer. Receive Him today. And those of you who have received Him, if you're waiting for a good time to be baptized, this is a good time to be baptized. Do it now. They that gladly received His word were baptized. Church, this is the right time. And we're talking about right now. This is the right time to be sanctified. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. We ought to be set apart from the world. We ought to look like, act like, talk like, walk like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ought to shine as light in the darkness. We ought to be salt that holds back corruption. And this is the time to do it. Not when you're older. I, I used to think, well, I'll have time when I'm older to serve the Lord. No, you may not have time at all. I'll, I'll do something great for God later on down the road. No, do it now. Let me encourage you to do this. Be organized, and now is the time to do it. Some of you are, are mired in disorganization, and you're not able to do what God wants you to do. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says this, Let all things be done decently and in order. Get your house in order. Be prepared to be called and be prepared to be sent. Start that ministry. Pray now. Read the Bible. Start a family altar. Take responsibility that God has given you. And don't wait or delay. Be organized with your pursuit of God. Be an evangelist. Spread the good news across the street and around the world. Take advantage of short-term mission trips. Be, in part, be a part of a training ministry. I say this. Every Minister is an inter interim minister. There's a start time, and as we found here, there's a stop time for every ministry. It may be at the end of your life, and it may be sooner than that. Every minister is an interim minister. Therefore, every ministry is a training ministry. So I ask everybody that serves, who knows what you know? If you were to go on vacation next week or die, would the work of God continue? So train those that come after you. And be an evangelist. Share the gospel. There's two things in young student adult ministry that I hope to pass on. Uh, you, all, you only have time for this. Uh, you want to train them to be a personal evangelist. You want them to be able to share what they've learned. And number two, you want them to grow in the foundational doctrines of the truth. You want them to be edified and built in the most holy faith. And then they ought to be able to share that with others. We don't have time to do anything else. You ought to love them. You ought to be effusive in that love, and you ought to answer their big questions. Be an evangelist. You have the answers. You have the hope that lies within you that needs to be shared, and you don't have a better time to do it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look to the finish line. Don't get distracted with anything else. You don't have time to do anything other than God's will in your life. If there's somebody that you need to forgive or that you need to be forgiven from somebody, don't delay in that.
Don't let a root of bitterness grow. If there's a sin that needs to be confessed, confess it today. There's a truth about the future. You don't know it. There's a truth about the fleeting. Our life is short. There's a truth about the Father. God's will has the priority of our life. Because if we don't do it, it's sin. I don't know what the Lord's speaking to you about today. The Holy Spirit's already doing His work. He's already touched your heart. There's a decision that needs to be made. Would you say yes to it? Don't look at whoever else moves. Say yes to the Scripture. Say yes today. Let's all stand, bow our heads, and close our eyes. You've heard the truth of God's Word. This, this admonition to pay attention and to get busy for the Lord and to understand how short our life is and to understand that everything that we've been given has been given to us by the Lord, even our time. So if the Lord makes changes in our life, He can do it. I've met some bitter people that walk around week after week after week getting mad at the changes that God makes. God keeps putting obstacles and making changes in their life and they just keep getting more and more bitter at God. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life and it must be obeyed at the speed of His will.